In this segment, I want to start getting into antenna design. Now, if this is the first segment that you actually are paying any attention to, um, I'd highly recommend that you track back a couple of episodes and take a look at the other previous segments I've done about uh, radio connectors and coax. That's very important. Do not just jump straight first, uh, face first into this. You'll probably fuck something up, and you'll most likely damage something, or just things won't work. The bottom line is you have to have the appropriate coax and appropriate connectors and a device that has those connectors and such. So, uh, past couple of episodes, I've been focusing on how to connect an antenna to your device, how to mod your device, how to get the proper coax, how to crimp stuff. That's over and done with. Let's learn how to make some antennas. But before we can do that, we have to understand some principles of what a radio wave is. So I've got a couple of slides in a presentation here. So let's go ahead to that and uh, I'll try to explain some of the some of the fundamentals. You have to understand that frequency is a measurement of oscillations of a sine wave for every second. Now a sine wave is an electrical wave that'll actually repeat up and down from a positive to a negative so many times per second. That is what frequency is, how many oscillations per second. Now, you have to understand wavelength, and the wavelength is the distance between two common or similar points on that waveform itself. This little symbol on screen is our friend lambda, and lambda is the Greek character in math for wavelength. Whenever you see this character, it is going to symbolize the, the equivalent understanding of what your wavelength is. So this means wavelength. Now, to calculate the wavelength, we need to know C, which is the velocity of light, or and F, frequency. So, the letter C is going to take place for the velocity of the speed of light, and lowercase f is going to take place for our frequency. So, because we're going to be working a lot in 2.4 gigahertz, we know that the frequency is going to be 2.4 gigahertz. And we know that the speed of light is 29,979,245,800 centimeters per second. So lambda, or wavelength, is equal to C divided by F. So your wavelength is equal to 29,979,245,800 divided by 2,4,000,000. And when we plug these values in for Wi-Fi, the wavelength comes out to about 12.49 centimeters or 4.9 inch. So there we go. Now we understand what the wavelength is. The wavelength is the actual physical distance between two common points on a sine wave or on a radio wave. And the reason we need to know this is because our antennas need to be specifically tuned to that wavelength. The reason being is an antenna is essentially a net for radio. So when you have an antenna, that when that wavelength changes, when that physical size of that antenna changes, you're also changing in what it actually absorbs on that frequency. So this is how you tune an antenna specifically for a frequency. So we know what wavelength is, we know what frequency is, and we know the basic concept of what an antenna does, but really, do you understand what, a, what an antenna really does? Let's say that this balloon, for a lack of a better example, because I don't feel like spending three hours to go and do a computer-generated simulation on a presentation that should only take 15 seconds. Let's say that this little red balloon is a visual representation of your radio field, or your estimated radiated pattern. In the very center of this, right around here, would be your transmitter. What your antenna is basically doing is it's going to manipulate this field of energy so you either have more or less gain. So, right now we have a perfect sphere. Now in radio this will never happen, this is just for visual sake here. Now, we have an antenna, and let's say we're going to make, today we're going to make some dipoles. And what it's going to do is, it's going to take this, this ball of energy, this estimated radiated pattern, and it's going to squeeze it. And if you notice, when you squeeze it, the sides squeeze out. Squeeze out of the sides. Same thing. So if we were to go this way, it'd squeeze up. So what the antenna is going to do is it's going to sacrifice height for distance. So, other types of antennas, are like beam or directional antennas, what it'll do is it'll squeeze the back end. So it'll do that. You'll notice how you got a nice frontal lobe. Each one of these bubbles are called lobes. And some antennas, what they'll do is they'll squeeze the middle. So by squeezing the middle, the sides stick out. 
So yeah, you're going to be losing height or you're going to be losing the direction from one end, but what you're doing is an antenna is effectively manipulating that field of energy like this balloon is being manipulated by me. So some of the antennas that will be eventually designed will actually take the back end of it and do that. But if you design your antenna wrong, well, that's what's going to happen. So it seems like it's really complicated, but this is just another step of the process. What your antenna is actually doing is it's taking that field of radiated energy, of radio, radio wave, and it's taking that aura and it's actually going to mold it and manipulate it into what you need. You, gotta, you can't add energy, you can remove it, but that kind of defeats the purpose of this. See, people actually think that just because you add an antenna to something means you're going to get better range. Or some other people think that just because you uh, increase your power output means you're going to broadcast further. To be all honest, a, a good antenna is usually more important than really strong power output because if your antenna isn't pushing out that signal where you want it or if it's not tuned properly it's not gonna work so let's go to the table side and I'll get to on um, building our first antenna called a dipole now a dipole is an antenna like a pole you know you have a positive and a negative dipole means you just have two sides and in a previous segment um, when I was doing introduction to radio and radio scanners uh, I explained dipoles and beam antennas and things of the such, so you might want to go back a bunch of episodes and check that out. So let's go to the table side and let's start putting stuff together. Before we begin, I want to analyze a couple of commonly found dipole antennas that we have in our 2.4 gigahertz products. The first thing I want to show is we all seen these, these little default antennas that come with your router. These are called rubber duck antennas, oftentimes because the rubber that's made, that they're made out of are often used in the bath time rubber duckies that you find in pedophile rape kits. It's got a standard reverse polarity SMA connector and inside of this is a typical dipole. Now we all know from experience that these aren't the best antennas to deal with, but do you really know why? And I've got a couple more antennas that are similar to this and we'll actually explore that fact before we get into anything. Now we've also got the antenna that I removed from the USB Wi-Fi card from a couple of segments ago. Um, for the sake of learning and understanding, I decided to put the antenna on the, uh, the sacrifice block and I cannibalized it for you guys. This is the antenna. It's just a circuit board. Nothing more, nothing less. Not very complicated. And the third product that I decided to go and pillage and destroy and make look fugly as all hell for you guys is my 2.4 gigahertz security camera. If you've noticed that this antenna is nothing more then quite literally, the shield has been stripped away from the signal conductor, and then a tube has been soldered onto the shield end on uh, on exact wavelength, or sorry, I should say size. So I take my uh, my my compass and using it kind of like a caliper, um, I've measured this, and it turns out to be 2.5 centimeters on both sides. So we got 2.5 centimeters here and 2.5 centimeters there. And doing some math on the wavelength, 2.5 centimeters should come out to about one quarter wavelength on each side. So this side is quarter wavelength, and this side is quarter wavelength of 2.4 gigahertz. And if you expand them both together, that means this is a half wave dipole, because we have one quarter on each end. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, if that's the case, why can't I make a two-wave dipole? And the reason being is because you have to remember when you change the length of the wire, you're changing the offset frequency, you're changing the frequency that it can receive. So if this was excessively long, like if it came out to here, well, not only would it be really bulky and you know, disgusting looking, but it would also pick up a different frequency. So you have to make sure that your antenna is properly tuned to the frequency that you're picking up. So if we were to... Uh, on average, a full wavelength, um, a full wavelength of 2.4 gigahertz is almost five inches. So if you have one wavelength on each side, that'd be a full wavelength dipole. But that could also change. You could also be picking up spurious frequencies across other other bands. So this is usually why you keep things as specific to the frequency as possible. And this is also why you can't just get like a 30 foot long piece of wire, attach it to your Wi-Fi card, and get all of the signals in the neighborhood. Okay. This little bugger, when I measure this, um, it came out to be 
uh, 2.5 centimeters as well, which means that little circuit board, yep, 2.5 centimeters, this little circuit board has 2.5 uh, centimeters on it on, on each side, and that creates a half-wave dipole. Yay. Why, why are we using half-wave? Why can't we make something better? But a lot of times half-wave works just fine. Now, if you wanted to make one, the first thing you're going to need to do is, of course, as always, make sure you have the appropriate coax. Um, reverse polarity SMA going into, I forget what kind of coax, I sacrificed this off of a really crappy antenna. Now, um, we're going to copy the design that, we've, that, that these guys are using. So we're going to need some kind of tubing or some kind of pipe. And this is going to actually fit down the center of this. And then we're going to solder a length of wire out of the top. Now, I got that tube from an old antenna, an old TV antenna. Nope, oh, go away, balloon. Um, remember the old rabbit ear antennas for TV, for broadcast TV? Well, of course, you can't use this antenna as is. So what I did was I extended it, and I just cut a segment out. And that's where this tube came from. This literally came from a leg of an old TV antenna. Now, you might actually have something else laying around the house. Like, you can actually go to the hardware store, and you can buy brass tube. This tube actually has the exact outer diameter and inner diameter, so you can actually feed LMR-195 coax down, down this hole. So this would be good for a really nice, you know, sturdy antenna. So, we've got the antenna, and I've marked 2.5 uh, uh, centimeters. As for the actual wire itself, any wire, you know, here's some, some household power cable that I pulled out of the garbage. I pulled the sheathing off of it just so I can solder it. You can use an old coat hanger. You know, here's a small length of coat hanger. Just something metal, something conductive, and something you can solder to. So, um, I'm going to use a very little saw. Got a little miter saw here. I got it from the dollar store for a buck with a couple of extra blades. And I've marked 2.5 centimeters. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go and saw this off to the proper length. Took a little bit of effort, not really, but for the sake of just bitching and complaining. Anyway, um, here we go. I got a marker. I'm gonna go and mark up 2.5 centimeters. 2.5 centimeters. Okay. And then we're gonna take some wire cutters. I've uh, already pre-tinned this wire just for the time constraints. We're gonna cut this wire. Now, whenever you're making something for 2.4 gigahertz, try to say, stay as spot on to your measurements as possible. So, having a hand file around and actually filing down things, down to the closest millimeter, uh, is a good idea. Personally, I tried to be less than half a millimeter off, but if you are, it's really not going to kill you. It will probably could kill your Wi-Fi card, but that's besides the point. Okay, so... We got the tube end, and we've got the little nubbin end. So, let's go ahead and get this on the coax. Got a little razor blade here, and I'm just going to pull off this outer insulator to reveal the shield. Trying very carefully not to actually pierce the shield, or even the center conductor. And then just, you know, peel the... Uh, the shield. Well, actually, first thing you got to do. I'm sorry. I always forget to do this. Go ahead and put your collar on first. But go ahead and put the, uh, the the bottom half of your dipole on. And we're just gonna go and mangle this as much as we can. And there we go. We just want it going in the opposite direction, just like that. And then we're going to reveal some of the center conductor. like so. Now I'm going to reposition my camera. We'll go to the, the desk clamp side so you can see me soldering this. Here we have the bottom half of the dipole locked firmly in the clamp. And you know what? I retract my statement earlier. It is actually easier to put this bottom half on after you've pulled all of this back. Once you pull all of the shielding back, 
feed this through the neck and out the top and you can expose this a little bit and taking the soldering iron and some solder try to get this affixed. Remember don't use an excessive amount of heat. You don't want to melt any of the important stuff on the inside and you especially don't want to ground anything. So you don't need an excessive amount of solder. Just get it affixed into place nicely. There we go. It's not too hard. Kind of like spot soldering. You know, instead of instead of just blobbing it on and going ape shit, just heat it up a little bit, apply a bit of solder, and just let it flow. There we go. That's going on nicely. There we go. So, make sure we get that nice and shielded up. It doesn't have to be super perfect. So, all right, not excessively difficult. Okay, I'm gonna let this cool down a little bit before we go to the next stage. Okay. And of course, as always, pre-tin. Pre-tin. Tell you the truth, we don't even need to really do anything as long as this little wire, the shield, uh, the, sorry, the, the signal wire, is 2.5 centimeters, then we really don't even have to do anything. But to tell you the truth, I want a slightly more sturdy wire than this really flimsy coax. I'm going to trim this down. That's an excessive amount. Okay. And, you know, here we go. Here's our little signal wire. I'll try to do this on frame. This is actually very awkward for me. So, you'll have to forgive me if I block anything. There we go. Not the prettiest solder job in the world, but it'll work. There we go. We have a nice little itty bitty dipole. But, it's unprotected. Uh, any of the elements can destroy this. I mean, even my fingers are throwing all of that off. So, I thought of something really, really ghetto-tastic. Took an old pen. Literally, it's just an old clicker pen. Pen. Hi, I'm a pen. There you go. You can cut the, uh, the pen to size. Uh, a lot of pens usually have that nice little ass end cap. You throw this in. Spooge some hot glue in the ass end, or whatever, and you get yourself a nice little detachable dipole. And if you can go get your ass to the hardware store, you can go and get these little itty bitty clamps. So now you can actually go around. You can uh, glue. Go ahead and glue your your uh, your dipole, and you can actually have a clamp on dipole. So if you take mass transit a lot or in a car a lot, when you're inside of a car uh, or a train, they're made out of metal. And as we all know from hopefully from earlier segments if I've explained, metal, ref uh, metal will reflect radio waves. So if you're inside of a metal car or if you're inside of a metal train, your radio signal can't get outside. So by taking this and just clipping it outside, well, you have an antenna outside. Now you can actually propagate your signal a little bit better. Okay, for quality's sake, I'm going to be listening to this access point for a little bit, and it's got the stock and standard rubber duck antenna. And what we have done is pretty much create uh, an exact copy of that antenna. So there should be no reason that our antenna operates any poorly than the other one. So let me go on a signal bunny. And what I'm going to tell her to do is unplug that antenna and switch it out. All right. And notice how we have no signal. She's swapping out the antenna. Seems like she's starting to plug the damn thing in. There it goes. So it goes to show you that the antenna that we've created, now of course this access point is clear across my house, in my lab, cutting through two walls, and as you can hear from NetStumbler going off every two seconds, I've got currently uh, nine active access points that are interfering with me. So, it goes to show you that the antenna that we created 
is just as good as a rubber duck. However, because it's on the end of a cable and we can put this outside of our window or outside of a vehicle, this antenna is actually better than, uh, in its features, better than an original, an original one. I decided to fashion a dipole with the, uh, the arms being three-quarter wavelength, nine, 91 millimeters, and look at that. We've got a, a, quite a bit of difference. So we went from an itty-bitty, inky-dinky little dipole to something that's slightly bigger. So it goes to show you, now if we were to make this a full wavelength, yeah, you know, you know, it would be you know, almost 10 inches long, but still, you'd have a significant amount more gain. So it goes to show that just with a little bit of wire, a piece of coax, and a pro appropriate connector, you can go ahead and make yourself a better antenna than what those stupid little rubber ducks have. If you have, if not the same amount of, of gain, then maybe you get a little bit more. And if you notice that now that I've had this new antenna, there aren't as many gaps in the radio signal. So really when you're making an antenna, you're not increasing, not just increasing or decreasing the signal strength itself, you're also increasing the link quality. You're making it so there's no more gaps and no more breaks. So this is just the first part in uh, a multi-part series, so if there's any questions or comments or if you have anything that you need to ask or would like to say, I know that I didn't cover everything, there's always the next episode. So uh, go out, enjoy yourself, have fun, and I'm surprised that that actually just shot up so much. Wow, that is mighty nice. Can you believe that I made this out of crap just laying? I made this out of garbage? Huh. Anyway, end of the segment. Have fun, everyone.